been in the process of redeeming His people. He has always been pro-women, just as He's always been pro-men and pro-children. He is such a kind God. It's just we're getting these cliff notes that are heretical, y'all. Don't listen to the cliff notes. Read the whole book. If you brought your Bibles, would you turn to Genesis? Genesis chapter one. Genesis chapter one, actually I told you a tale. Genesis chapter three. Genesis chapter three, verse 21. Actually back up, we'll start at verse one. I wanna give you the full Monty, biblically speaking. Now the serpent was more crafty than the other beasts of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die? For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. I feel like I hear the same theme on Twitter every single day. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife hid from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to man and said to him, where are you? Interesting that God is completely omniscient. He knows exactly where they are. But part of his mercy is helping us to be cognizant of how we've drifted. So this is a merciful question. It's not a diagnostic question. Where are you? In other words, where have you drifted? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God said, who? Who told you you were naked? Chris often preaches, since when did somebody else's voice elevate above God's and ours or our cultures as being absolutely authoritative? He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. I wanted to go to Chipotle, but she just told me to eat here. It's a tiny bit of liberty with the text right there. Just wanted to make that clear. <laughs> then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? Verse 21. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord said, behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing what is good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. This has been read over and over and over again in both evangelical culture and secular culture as a punitive passage. It's depicted God as kind of this unibrowed librarian who boots us out of his presence whenever we make a misstep. Y'all, we've been reading it wrong. If you read this passage in the context it was written, in the context it was given, you'll recognize that the word right there, drove out the man in verse 24, comes from the Hebrew word galrash which is also used in a redemptive context in Exodus when it says God realized his people, and I'm paraphrasing here, were idiots, and so he herded them out of slavery into freedom. He herded them like a good shepherd away from what would kill them into greener pastures for their own good because they didn't even know how to leave slavery. When you stop and think of the context of the Garden of Eden, what would have happened had they eaten from the tree of life? What would have had happened? Y'all can talk back. It's not Sunday morning, I'm not a pastor. <laughs> what would have happened? They would have been forever frozen 
in the Garden of Eden forever separated from the intimacy with God that he designed them for. And so when God recognizes, not only have these yahoos gone to the wrong menu, if I do not usher them out, they will never have a shot at having the intimacy with me I created them for redeemed. So he ushers them out of the garden only after he clothes them in leather, ushers them out. Yes, he ushers them out because of original sin, but y'all, he ushers them out because of miraculous mercy. This way I can begin the redemptive process. And then he establishes an angel, a cherubim, a chubby angel, an angel in Spanx and a flaming sword as these divine bouncers, not because humans are bad, but because he wants to make sure Imago Day doesn't get back to that tree and be forever frozen, separated from him. It's actually incredibly redemptive if we read it right. We've gotta spend a little more time with the spirit and God's word, head to the right a quarter of an inch to Exodus. This is kind of a fun one that I've heard also used as a punitive text or a text where people will use as a proof text and say the Bible does not have any more application today. When people say the Bible's boring, I'm like, no, you're boring, you stupid idiot. That comes from very deep gift of mercy. Um, Exodus chapter 23, verse 19. The best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Gross. So why is that in the Bible? Why are these kosher dietary laws in the Bible? Well, if you study this ancient period of history, you'll find out that pagans in the occult would have this exact stew brewing when they danced before idols as a way of goading idols into making their land more productive. This is an occultic stew. This is also pre-refrigeration. So God says, you know what? You drink some you know, medium rare baby goat in hot mama's milk, that is nasty town. That is just a sure case of, of E. coli. So let me keep y'all from doing that. And also y'all don't need to retain pagan practices. This is not a punitive God trying to limit what they eat. This is a heavenly father who says, I'm gonna establish parameters for your good. You may not understand them, but I'm doing this for your good, for redemption. Head to the right to Deuteronomy. This is my favorite new passage. Deuteronomy 22, this passage and a few others like it have been used, especially in the last four or five years by lots and lots of people, lots and lots of former evangelicals to prove that our God is a misogynist that our God hates women, that our God objectifies women, that our God oppresses women. Y'all, that's straight from the pit. That is not true. But if we don't take times to move into spiritual maturity, we will be just pulled to the right and pulled to the left by all kinds of winds of heresy. Listen to this passage, because it does sound funky town at first read. Deuteronomy 22, verses 28 and 29. If a man meets a virgin who is not betrothed and seizes her and lies with her and they are found, then the man who lay with her shall give to the father of the young woman 50 shekels of silver and she shall be his wife because he has violated her. He may not divorce her all his days. I read a blog recently accusing God and Christian culture as being misogynistic, patriarchal and anti-woman based on this passage. And I wanted so badly to call this woman and go, honey, it's exactly the opposite. Because when God gave these parameters, he was giving it to a people group who had been for 400 years in slavery, basically under the authority of what we would now call the first iteration of Sharia law. And what they were used to is anywhere a 12 year old and up woman who was not engaged, anywhere a woman over the age of 12 went, if she went by herself, she could be raped by any man and the men had no culpability. That's why if you study Josephus, you study ancient culture, women almost always went everywhere in groups. And God knew 
that his precious women were being horrifically treated. So he establishes a new rule under the civil authority. He establishes a new rule. This is not about punishing women and making them marry their rapists. That's not at all the case here. He says, what I'm gonna do is establishing something that is restraining the evil whereby women have had to, to suffer and survive all these years. What God was doing was saying, I'm gonna protect my girls. Culture, you have allowed women to be subjugated and violently mistreated, but I'm gonna restore the inherent dignity and value that I breathed into women because we don't take enough time asking spirit to reveal these redemptive truths to us. You and I go, oh, I don't know, I guess he is a misogynist. I mean, I guess the God of the Old Testament is a unibrowed librarian, and then Jesus kind of morphs in to this like really warm, fuzzy Enneagram guy in the New Testament. Y'all, if that was true, God would be bipolar. That is not true. And here's another thing that gets all up in my craw. I'm telling you, it bugs me so bad. I'm wearing Spanx and it makes me hot. And if these Spanx break, some of y'all are gonna lose an eye this morning. But this gets just, it's like a burr all up in my Spanx. I've heard so many people say, well, Jesus says, referring to the New Testament. And I'm like, <laughs> Christianity 101, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, our God is a Trinitarian God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So just because it's not red doesn't mean Jesus didn't say it! Drives me crazy! Every single word in here, our Redeemer breathed. Luke 24, he says, all of that is about me, baby. All of that is about me. I have loved you since the beginning of time. So our God is not only not a misogynist, he has always been in the process of redeeming his people. He has always been pro-women just as he's always been pro-men and pro-children. He is such a kind God. It's just we're getting these cliff notes that are heretical, y'all. Don't listen to the cliff notes, read the whole book. Miroslav Balf. Miroslav Balf is, is one of my favorite theologians. I love all the dead guys. This guy's still alive, so I have to be careful because I don't want him to think I'm inappropriate because he's married, so it's a very platonic crush. I'm not gonna lift up my pants because I have tattooed his name on the back of my calf, but other than that, it's a very Levitical kind of crush. But he says this in a book you should read called Captive to the Word of God. He says this, the rich polyphony contained in the Bible, harmonious as well as discordant, is its strength, not its weakness. It makes the Bible alive, a witness to God speaking and acting at various points into the dynamics of life, capable of being translated into a wide variety of situations today. Truthful theological readings of the Bible will always seek to honor both the overarching story, which gives the Bible its unity, and the concrete character of its diverse text. In other words, if we take the time to move towards spiritual maturity, we recognize, oh my goodness, if I was a woman living in that era right after being under 400 years of slavery in Egypt, this would be the most liberating thing I could ever experience. Because the king of all kings is saying, baby, you are worth protecting. You are precious to me. Instead, we hear this gross, it's not even a, it's not even a, a cliff note, it's a gross heretical explanation that is taken totally out of context. Yeah, we don't need to just move on toward inspiration, we have got to move on toward maturity. It's incumbent upon us, whether you are here and you are a youngin, or whether you're one of the women who stand up, Chris and I tease about how Propel starts at belly rings and goes to bladder control problems. <laughs> Wherever you are on the age continuum, if you know Jesus, it is incumbent upon us to spend time alone with him, to dive into this book because it is a love story. The overarching meta narrative is there is this perfect, holy God 
who is absolutely smitten with sinners like us. He's not mad at us. He's not a unibrowed librarian who boots us out of his party when we mess up. That is not his character. If you study what he says in context, you go over and over and over and over again. He's a redeemer. Over and over and over again. He has hurting us, shepherding us toward our good. He's not this punitive rule maker. He's a merciful redeemer. He's a kind parent. Everything he does is ultimately for our good. Let's look at one last passage and this may be my favorite because I love me some Peter. Turn to John chapter 21. I love Peter because he is just hot mess on a stick. You know, I mean, he's just constantly stepping in it, constantly messing up. You know, even if you're a priester, you go to church just on Christmas and Easter and somebody invited you to propel and they told you this had to do with essential oils. Even if you're a priester, I bet you nickel you know about Peter because when you go to church at Easter, we almost always talk about Peter's infamous betrayal, that he threw Jesus under the bus at Jesus' most poignant place of need And he said three times, vehemently and vulgarly, I don't know the man. And then he threw in some expletives just so the crowd would be convinced there's no way a hot mess like that man could actually be in alignment with the Christ. So most of us know that betrayal, probably the most infamous betrayal in all of Holy Writ. And then here is the restoration that you probably also know. I love this story. We're gonna read it in the black and white and red, and then we're gonna read between the lines, because man, the redemption in the story is even better than you read at first glance. John chapter 21, verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, and of course, this is after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, and this is during that time period where for 40 days, Jesus roamed to and fro about the earth in his resurrected body and appeared according to Acts and Josephus to more than a hundred people in his resurrected body. And you remember Peter was so confused by the crucifixion and finding an empty tomb. Do you remember how he responded at the beginning of John 21? Very typical male statement, I'm going fishing. (laughs) I'm going fishing. What's so precious at the beginning of John 21 is the other men, you know, they're, they're down to 11 disciples, because Judas has has gone. And so there's Pete, and then there's 10 left, and the other 10 who know exactly what Pete has done say, we will go with you. I mean, we could preach a year's worth of women's conferences on that. Because as much as it grieves me, these deconstruction narratives we're reading, these deconversion narratives I see week after week after week on social media, it's really easy for us to draw the line even deeper between confused saints and what we believe. And I'm like, let's let's look at the, the, the narrative in scripture. Pete has thrown Christ himself under the bus. You talk about apostate, He said, I don't even know him right before Jesus was crucified. And immediately afterwards, the 10 who he's been in a small group with say, we've got you. We've got your back. You come be with us. We wanna be part of your redemption, your restoration process. They go fishing, Jesus appears on the water. It's an exact bookend to where Pete first decided he was the Christ. Remember, there's the miraculous catch of fish in Luke's gospel chapter five, and now here at John 21, same exact lake. It's called a different thing for political reasons, but they're at the exact same spot that Pete began his earthly ministry with Jesus Christ, where he was undone by the miraculous catch of fish. And then he says, Lord, don't look at me, I'm a sinful man. Remember this, he threw himself in the bottom of the boat, and Jesus said, oh, Pete, come on. I'm not mad at you, I just want you to change your Facebook status. You're gonna go from being a fisherman to a fisher of men. Well, y'all, in John 21, they're the exact same geographical spot. God knows we are not the sharpest tools in the shed. He makes his redemption so clear. They're the exact same spot. Peter's in a boat again. A stranger appears on shore. They haven't caught anything. He says, throw your nets to the right side of the boat. And then they catch so many fish because fish are leaping into their nets. Don't you know even Pete went, this feels a little deja vu to me. 
It's exactly the miracle that began his time with Jesus' earthly ministry. And then Jesus comes to shore. When they had finished breaking breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Pete says to Jesus, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus says to Peter, feed my sheep. And then they have that same conversation two more times. Three times, Jesus says, Pete, do you love me? And Pete says, yes, Lord, you know, I love you. Now, why have y'all been taught they have that same conversation three times that Pete answers that, yes, I love you three times? Why have you been taught that? Exactly, because Pete denied him three times. So based on especially first century Jewish preoccupation with numerology, they were making sure we know he was restored because exactly three times he confesses he does know Jesus. That's so anemic. That's so not the miracle of this passage. It's true, but it's like good night. I mean, this is like having chips or celery with queso. You gotta have chips with queso. The fullness of this passage is Jesus uses a different word for love here. Remember in the Greek, the New Testament language, it's Greek and Aramaic. There are three words for love. There's eros, which is getting jiggy with it. That's kind of love I hope if I ever get hooked up on eHarmony to have as a single woman. (laughs) So you've got eros, and then you've got phileo, which is just a friendship, kind of a meal kind of love, and then you've got agapeo. Agapeo is a sacrificial love. It's loving someone else more than anything. So the first time Jesus asked Pete, Pete, do you love me? He says, hey, Pete, do you agapeo me? Do you love me more than anything? And Pete says, Lord, you know you love me. I just threw you under the bus, Jesus. You know the best I got is phileo. The best I got is loving you like a brother. Second time Jesus says to Pete, I can only imagine the compassion in his countenance. Peter, do you agapeo me? Lord, you know me. You know what I just did? I phileo you. Third time. Now scripture doesn't say this. This is my mental picture. So this is just my imagination. I wanna make that clear. But third time, I imagine Peter just staring at his feet in the sand. Just staring at his shoes. Just overwhelmed by his own culpability. That he knows exactly what he's done. And the third time I pictured Jesus putting his hand, his nail scarred hand under Pete's chin and tilting that disciple's face up toward him, looking in his eyes and he goes, Pete, do you phileo me? He knows Pete didn't agapeo him at that point. He lowers the love bar. For this man, so many people would castigate as a loser. He goes, I'm not kicking you off the team, son. I'm not kicking you off the team. I'm actually naming you team captain. I'm gonna build the whole New Testament church on your shoulders. Y'all, this book is so much more redemptive than we usually believe it to be. I was at a conference recently. It was a conference of people who were gathering who were in recovery from addiction, either drugs or sexual addiction. And it was a Friday night, all day Saturday conference. Friday night, I was sitting over in that area and there was a woman up the front who was dancing during worship that I was just completely distracted by just radiant older woman, long gray hair. She was wearing a white gauzy skirt and she was just praising the Lord and dancing and dipping and spinning. So I was just undone by this woman's just liberty in worship. And I thought, man, I'd love to know her story because in my experience, the most liberated saints usually have the most amazing stories of rescue. And so I I thought, man, I wish I could meet that woman. Well, sure enough, the next morning, I got there early because I was teaching the next morning and this woman was in church early. And I thought, oh, cool, it's only the two of us in the sanctuary, the program hasn't started. So I went over to her and I confessed that I had watched her the night before. And I said, ma'am, I just wanna tell you, just watching you worship Jesus just undid me. Your freedom and the way you can tell you're so madly in love with Jesus. I was just, I was struck by how good he is by the way you responded to him. And she told me her name was Joyce. And the moment she spoke, I was like, oh, now I love her even more because she had this real gravelly kind of two-pack-a-day voice. And uh, she said, I can't help but dance because he's rescued me from so much. 
And then she told me her story of abuse and being an alcoholic. And she said, Jesus just restored me from all that. Well, we kept talking. I was like, this is just amazing. You know how other people's stories, Revelation 12 says, that's what just stabs the knife even further into the lizard's breast. He's defeated by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. The most powerful thing y'all will do as a result of Propel isn't listen to us, it's to talk to each other and to talk to the world around you. So I said, oh man, I wish I could hear your whole story, but the conference is starting. And I was like, maybe I'll get to talk to you afterwards. Well, maybe five minutes later, they introduced me because I got to teach that morning. I walk up on the platform. I don't like being this far removed. First of all, I just feel like it's probably a really awkward vantage point for y'all. You don't need to see all this from that angle. But I also wanna be closer. And so this particular church had steps on the front. So I walked right down so I could kind of be with all the women. And I walked down and then realized, oh my goodness, here's Joyce. I'm standing right in front of Joyce. So usually I don't accost people I don't know that well. But my enthusiasm got the better of me this morning. And I went, y'all, this is my new friend, Joyce. She's got the most amazing voice. So I'm gonna have Joyce read the passage we're gonna focus on this morning. It was from Hebrews. I already had my Bible open. I kind of grin at Joyce, hand her the microphone and point to the passage I have highlighted. And she seemed a little bit discombobulated, but then she grinned and started into the passage. She got thrown by a few of the hard words, but then after a minute, she found a rhythm and she read the rest of the passage beautifully. I said, wasn't that awesome? When she finished, people clapped politely. Joyce sat down, I went back and did the rest of my business. Well, when the conference was over, Joyce came up to me and she goes, Lisa, I just have to tell you how you having me read that passage has impacted me. And I was like, oh, Joyce, I'm so sorry. Cause I thought she probably has like some kind of trauma associated with reading out loud and I've just made it worse. I'm gonna need to pray for therapy. So I was like, I'm so sorry. I just was kind of so excited when I looked up and you were in front of me and she goes, oh, no, 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 no. She goes, Lisa, I've got to tell you the rest of my story. What I didn't tell you last night is that um, the guy I was engaged to left me for another younger woman eight months ago. And after 13 years of sobriety, I fell off the wagon. And she said, I got rip roaring drunk and spent an entire week just absolutely wasted. And she said, I came back to church because I was in leadership and I confessed to them that I'd fallen off the wagon. And she said, because of me falling off the wagon after 13 years of sobriety, they asked me to leave the leadership team. And she said, I understand those kind of boundaries. She said, but it it broke my heart. And she said, it happened in this church. She said, this is the first time I've been in this church in eight months. She said, I had to leave because I was so distracted during worship. I felt like everybody in church knew. And I felt like every time I walked into church, I was wearing a scarlet letter A for alcoholic on my chest. And she said, and there's no way you could have known that when I was a little girl, I was terrified to read out loud. She said her mother didn't send her to kindergarten. She didn't send her to school until the first grade. She didn't know who her daddy was. So a naive teacher, the first day of school in the first grade, asked Joyce to stand up and read. And Joyce said, I had never read, I read, I didn't know the alphabet. And she said, I stood up and the letters on the page just looked like hieroglyphics. And she said, the only thing I needed to do was just recite something I'd heard on television and hope that what I said out loud matched what was in the book. And she said, as soon as I started reciting something I'd heard on television, all the kids in class began to laugh. And she said, they started calling me stupid the first day of first grade and it stuck until I quit high school. She said, I have promised to myself, I would never ever again put myself in the position where I had to read out loud. And I said, Joyce, I I am so sorry. And she goes, oh no, oh no. She goes, Lisa, this place that held so much dishonor for me became a place of honor because out of all these people, all these recovering addicts, you picked me. And she goes, I know I didn't read every word perfectly, but I think I did a pretty good job. And I said, you did a great job, Joyce. And she goes, I just felt like the whole time I was reading, God was saying, that's my girl. That's my girl. That's my girl.